This episode of Space Time is brought to you by Moonshot, a podcast that explores the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. You can subscribe to Moonshot wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Pocket Casts, and lots more. This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 86. Coming up on Space Time, solving a black hole mystery, the Mars 2020 rover to have 23 eyes, and the discovery of strange auroral activity on Jupiter. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have, for the first time, measured the acceleration zone of a powerful jet of plasma being shot deep into space by a feeding black hole. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, indicate that these intense plasma streams are charged within 30,000 kilometres of the black hole itself. Black holes feed by gravitationally sucking in stars, planets and clouds of gas and dust that venture too close. All this doomed material forms an accretion disk around the black hole, where gravity and friction crush and tear it apart. Once this material passes a point of no return called the event horizon, it falls forever into the black hole's singularity, a place of infinite density and zero volume where science's understanding of physics breaks down. Once beyond the event horizon, escape velocity exceeds 300,000 kilometres per second, the speed of light in a vacuum, and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Therefore, nothing, not even light, can escape a black hole, hence the name. But not all the material on the accretion disk is destined to fall into the black hole. As it's being crushed and ripped apart, it's also being heated to millions of degrees, becoming ionised. And some of it, a bit like crumbs at a dinner table, ends up not being consumed by the black hole, but instead gets channelled along intense magnetic field lines and eventually shot light years into space in powerful jets of plasma beaming out perpendicular to the accretion disk along the black hole's rotational axis. These jets are so powerful and hot, they literally change space around them. Scientists have long debated exactly where and how this process happens. Now, using NASA's New Star Space Telescope and the UltraCam instrument on the William Herschel Observatory at La Palma on the Canary Islands, scientists have finally been able to measure the distance that the particles in these jets travel before they will turn on and become bright sources of light. That distance is known as the acceleration zone. To pinpoint the location, scientists looked at two systems in the Milky Way known as X-ray binaries. Each of these binaries consists of a stellar mass black hole feeding off a normal star. They studied each of these systems at different points during periods of outburst, which is when the accretion disk brightens because of material falling in. One system, known as V404 Cygni, had nearly reached peak brightness when scientists observed it in June 2015. In fact, at the time it experienced what was then the brightest outburst of any X-ray binary seen so far in the 21st century. The other system, called GX339-4, was less than 1% of its maximum brightness when it was observed. The star and black hole in this system are much closer together than that in V404 Cygni. However, despite their differences, both systems showed similar time delays, about a tenth of a second, between when New Star first detected the X-ray light and UltraCam detected flares in visible light slightly later. To you and me, that delay of one tenth of a second is less than the blink of an eye, but it's highly significant for the physics of black hole jets. The study's lead author, Pashak Gandhi from the University of Southampton, says it's possible that the physics of the jet isn't determined by the size of the accretion disk, but instead by the speed, temperature and other properties of particles at the jet's base. The best hypothesis scientists have to explain these results is that the X-ray light originates from material very close to the black hole. Strong magnetic fields propel some of this material at very high speeds along the jet. This results in particles colliding at near light speed, in the process energising the plasma until it begins to emit the stream of optical radiation caught by UltraCam. As to exactly where in the jet this is occurring, well, the measured delay between the optical and the X-ray light helps to explain this. By multiplying the amount of time by the speed of the particles, which is nearly the speed of light, scientists are able to determine the maximum distance the particles have travelled. And this expanse of about 30,000 kilometres represents the inner acceleration zone in the jet, where the plasma feels the strongest acceleration and turns on by emitting light. Now that 30,000 kilometres may be some three times the diameter of the Earth, 
but in cosmic terms it's just a tiny amount, especially considering that the black hole in V404 Cygni has some 3 million times the Earth's mass. To achieve their measurements, the space-based X-ray telescope and the ground-based optical telescope had a look at the X-ray binaries at exactly the same time during the outbursts, in order for scientists to be able to calculate the tiny delay between the telescope's detections. Such coordination requires complex planning between observatory teams. And it was only possible for about an hour during the outburst. The results also appear to connect with scientists' understanding of supermassive black holes, much bigger than the stellar mass ones in this study. In one supermassive black hole system, known as Beo Lesertre, weighing some 200 million times the mass of our Sun, scientists were able to infer time delays a million times greater than what was in this study. That means the size of the acceleration area of the jets is likely related to the mass of the black hole. The next steps are to confirm this measured delay in observations of other X-ray binaries, and then to develop a theory that can tie together the jets in black holes of all sizes. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. NASA says improvements in camera technology mean its next rover to the red planet Mars will have no fewer than 23 cameras to create sweeping panoramas, reveal obstacles, study the atmosphere and assist science instruments. When NASA's Pathfinder touched down on the surface of the red planet back in 1997, it had a total of just five cameras on board. Two on the mast that popped up from the Pathfinder lander itself and three on its microwave oven-sized robotic six-wheeled rover Sojourner. Since then, camera technology has taken a quantum leap. The larger golf cart-sized Mars rovers Spirit and Opportunity each had 10 cameras, including on their landers. And the car-sized Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover has no less than 17 cameras. You may not realise it, but photo sensors that were improved by the space program have now become commercially ubiquitous. Cameras have shrunk in size, they've increased in quality, and they're now carried in virtually every cell phone, tablet and laptop. And the 23 cameras now being incorporated aboard the Mars 2020 rover, now under construction at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, will set new standards. Six cameras aboard NASA's Mars 2020 rover will provide mission managers with dramatic views during the rover's descent and landing, including provision of the first videos of parachutes opening in the atmosphere of another planet. Replacing Curiosity's high-definition mast cam is the new MassCam Z stereoscopic cameras, the Z stands for zoom because the new cameras will have 3 to 1 zoom which will act as the rover's main eyes. They can also support more 3D images and are ideal for examining geologic features and scouting potential samples from long distances. In fact, features like erosion and soil textures will be able to be spotted at distances greater than a football field. Routinely using three-dimensional images at high resolution should pay off in big ways. That's because they'll be useful both for long-range and near-field science targets. Another camera on the new rover will be known as the SuperCam Remote Microimager. This high-resolution remote colour imager will do the job of the old ChemCam used on Curiosity. As well as that, there'll be a cache cam camera inside the rover's body, which will study samples as they're stored and left on the surface for collection by future sample return missions. A lander vision system camera will use computer vision during the landing phase, using a new technology called terrain relative navigation. And then there's SkyCam, a suite of weather instruments which include a sky-facing camera for studying clouds in the Martian atmosphere. The Spirit, Opportunity and Curiosity rovers were all equipped with engineering cameras for planning drives, known as navcams, as well as avoiding hazards, known as hascams. Now these cameras only produced one megapixel images in black and white. But on the new rover, the engineering cameras have been upgraded to acquire high-resolution 20 megapixel wide-field colour images. The wider field of view is crucial for the 2020 mission, and that means less time spent panning, snapping pictures and stitching. The cameras are also able to reduce motion blur, as they can take photos while the rover's on the move. As the name suggests, the Mars 2020 rover is slated to launch in 2020. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Marine archaeologists and salvagers have discovered a rare mariner's astrolabe in a shipwreck off the coast of Amman. The astrolabe, stamped with the Portuguese royal coat of arms, was found in the wreckage of the 500-year-old Portuguese ship Esmeralda. 
The Esmeralda was part of a fleet of 20 vessels under the command of the explorer Vasco da Gama, who in 1498 discovered a direct route from Europe to India. At the time, the only known passage to India was under Arab control. The Esmeralda sank to the bottom during a violent storm. Astrolabs were used in classical antiquity by astronomers and navigators to measure the inclined position in the sky of a celestial body. They were used primarily to identify planets and stars to determine your local latitude at a given local time. The problem is they weren't very reliable in the heaving decks of ships in rough seas. Eventually, the Mariner's Astrolab was developed to solve the problem. The Mariner's Astrolab, or Sea Astrolab, was really more of a graduated circle with a turning board used to measure vertical angles. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Let's talk about the astrolabe. It, it is a quite unusual uh, find and, and quite rare, I would imagine. Uh, it is indeed. So this is um, something that has been excavated from a shipwreck, an, an ancient shipwreck off the coast of Oman in the Middle East. And the thinking is that this is the earliest example ever found of one of these devices. It's called an astrolabe, but one that's specifically used for navigation, for marine navigation. It's a mariner's tool because, and the reason I say that, and we might preface our remarks on this topic with a little bit of history here. Yes. So an astrolabe is basically a a device. It's usually in the shape of a brass disc with calibrations on it with a a kind of sighting or a pointer on it, which you line up with a star. So you you kind of hold the disc up in one hand so that it's in the vertical plane, and then you point the bit that's pivoted towards a star and you can read off the height of the star and that's the basis of an astrolabe there are other aspects to it too because you can use them for finding stars as well but that instrument actually dates back i think the earliest record found of one is in the ninth century there was a lot of middle eastern astrolabes made they were made by basically scientists in Mm. the in the 10th and 11th centuries so those astrolabes are used for scientific or were used for scientific purposes this one that's been found in the ocean is much later than that and it's fairly accurately dated at between 1495 and 1502 when it was made but the reason why it's exciting is because it was used for navigation it was a mariner's astrolabe rather than one that's used by scientists for you know working out the positions of stars and things like that so that's the bottom line what is it well once again it's a brass disc uh, very highly corroded it might actually be copper actually looking at the um, yeah it's hard uh, to tell isn't images it? that that I've seen. But the history is really interesting because this ship actually sank in 1503. And it was a, one of the fleet of Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer, who was an explorer. So he, he was doing his thing. The particular ship that we're talking about was called the Esmeralda, which is a name I love. Mm. Uh, the Esmeralda went down during a storm 1503. So that's the latest date this astrolabe could have been made. Actually, you could probably say 1502 because they'd been at sea for quite a while. But the the really interesting bit and the reason why you can be fairly precise about the earliest date that it could be made is because of the markings on it. So yes, it's got the degree angles on, which apparently were revealed by laser processing at the University of Warwick in the UK. Yeah, because you Uh, can't see it with the naked eye. It's so corroded. That's right. um, The technology of today can reveal these hidden things. It is astonishing what you can do with this kind of thing. And I've seen examples of this sort of thing before, ancient mechanisms being dissected by lasers and computers, and x-rays too, in fact, in some cases. This one was done by laser scans, though, as I said, at the University of Warwick. And one of the things, well, it's certainly revealed the graduations, but there are emblems on this astrolabe as well. And one of them is the personal emblem of Don Manuel I, who was the king of Portugal at the time. And he ascended to the throne in... 1495. And so the thinking is that his royal emblem would not have been placed on the astrolabe if he wasn't king. So the thinking is that when this astrolabe was made, he was the king, and that dates it after 1495. The boat sank in 1503. So you've got a fairly narrow window of when this thing was made. So it's probably a pretty new device when it was carried on board the ship. Yeah, yeah um, it would have been considered high tech in those days, I imagine. Absolutely. Yeah, very high tech. Astrolabes go back 500 years before this, but but to have one that is for marine purposes, it's very interesting. It's, yeah. as I said, probably the earliest known. So it would have been used to assist with navigation, I suspect. That's uh, right, yeah. 
and so, um, and, and so they, using the measurements from the astrolabe, they, they would have been able to figure out would it, uh, where they were or where they were going, but how accurately? Pretty accurately, actually. In terms of latitude, that's the, the great thing about an astrolabe. You can use it to measure well the height of the sun or the height of a star above the horizon, either at noon in the case of the sun or at um, at the um, highest point in the case of a star, which is kind of like a a star noon. Mm. Uh, And once you've made those measurements, certainly as far as stars are concerned, that immediately gives you your latitude because if you know the position of the star in the sky, you measure its height above the horizon, that tells you your latitude. Longitude's a trickier thing to work out. And as I'm sure you know, it was another more than 200 years before the problem of finding it out. Yeah, yeah, that was done by chronometers. So it was John Harrison, the Englishman, who perfected the chronometer. And I think about 1760 was when his final chronometer was made that really solved the problem of longitude properly. But before that, longitude was an iffy thing. And of course, that comes about because the Earth's rotating. So you need to know the time accurately Mm. before you can make any measurements. And if you don't know that, you do have some idea, but it's a very high level of error. But latitude is is different. Latitude is easier to find, and an astrolabe will do that for you. And by the way, just a footnote to what I was saying before, it's made of bronze. Bronze. Uh, That's the material of of which it's made. Now, the other interesting thing in terms of uh, seafaring navigation um, the Vikings didn't use an astrolabe as far as I know but they did use a thing called a sunstone to navigate that's right they did which were basically um, I think the sunstones were magnetized stone that pointed north I think that's right there are there is something else though, about a sunstone that's uh, in the back of my mind and I can't think of what yeah, it was I, I, I but, not sure uh, but I, I think they uh, could hold it up to the sun on a cloudy day and it would um, enable them to see the disk of the sun through the clouds or something like that and um, it, it, uh, that's right I've certainly read about this I do remember the idea of it being useful on cloudy days but I think it's because they were magnetic yeah maybe um, you, maybe you're right you, um, and so it, it sort of basically instead of seeing the it, it lets you see uh, which way north is. Yeah, the Vikings were a clever bunch as well. They, well, this they is the thing. Kind of These sorts of finds show you that um, the people of hundreds or even thousands of years ago were not dumb. I mean, they had some pretty high-tech concepts that they worked with. Uh, it's only technology of today that makes us think we're more clever, but we we really aren't. We've just got better tools. But uh, that, That's correct. They had it all together. And, and, and in fact, um, uh, something I kind of ob- ob- obliquely alluded to a couple of minutes ago when I was talking about X-ray, X-raying ancient mechanism, uh, that's the ant- Antikythera mechanism. And so this is something that was found off Alexandria, the bottom of the Mediterranean, dated at about 0 BC or 0 AD. And it's basically a planet simulator. It's full of gears. It's oh, highly corroded. Yes, I've heard but, of this. But, but X-rays mm. revealed that it's got all these toothed wheels inside it, which actually give you um, an indication of the position of planets it's an extraordinary thing and it's 2000 years old it's you know it's it really is staggering stuff um, is that kind of engineering at that time uh, of course gives rise to all kinds of conspiracy theories which yes. we won't touch on just now Andrew. that's dr fred watson from the australian astronomical observatory speaking with andrew dunkley on our sister program space nuts and this is space time i'm Stuart gary If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. It's been discovered that Jupiter's intense northern and southern auroral lights pulse independently of each other. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, indicate that very high-energy X-ray emissions at Jupiter's south pole consistently pulse every 11 minutes. However, those at the Jovian north pole are more erratic, increasing and decreasing in brightness, independent of the south pole. It's a behaviour very different from the auroral activity seen here on Earth where the southern and northern lights, the aurora australis and aurora borealis, broadly mirror each other and are both produced by geomagnetic storms on the sun. The new findings are based on observations made by both the European Space Agency's XMM-Newton and NASA's Chandra X-ray Space Telescopes. 
The other gas giants, such as Saturn, don't produce any detectable X-ray aurora, which makes the findings on Jupiter especially puzzling. The study's lead author, William Dunn, from the Mullard Space Science Laboratory and the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, says researchers thought the activity of Jupiter's X-ray auroral emissions would have been coordinated through the planet's magnetic field and so didn't expect to see them pulsing independently. Dunn says scientists will now need to try and understand what's happening, and he plans to use NASA's Juno spacecraft, which is currently orbiting the gas giant. Since arriving at Jupiter in 2016, Juno's been rewriting much of what's known about the solar system's largest planet. The problem is the probe doesn't have an X-ray instrument. So, in order to understand how the X-ray auroral activity is produced, the authors will combine Juno's observations with those from XMM, Newton and Chandra. One of the theories that Juno may help to prove or disprove is that Jupiter's auroras form separately when the planet's magnetic field interacts with the solar winds. The authors suspect that the magnetic field lines vibrate, producing waves that carry charged particles towards the poles, and that these change in speed and direction of travel until they collide with Jupiter's atmosphere, generating X-ray pulses. Using the XMM, Newton and Chandra observatories, the authors produced maps of Jupiter's X-ray emissions, identifying an X-ray hotspot at each pole. Each of these hotspots covers an area bigger than the surface of the Earth. Studying each to identify patterns of behaviour, they found that the hotspots have very different characteristics. Scientists already know it involves a combination of solar wind ions and ions of oxygen and sulphur originating from eruptions on the volcanic moon Io. However, their relative importance in producing the X-ray emissions is still unclear. What's made these observations possible is being able to see both the Jovian poles at once, something which hasn't been possible over the last 10 years. Comparing the behaviours of the two poles allows researchers to learn about the complex magnetic interactions going on. The authors hope to continue tracking the activity of Jupiter's poles over the next two years, using X-ray observing campaigns in conjunction with Juno, to see if this previously unreported behaviour is commonplace. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. OK, let's take a break from the show now and bring a few words from today's sponsor. And today's episode of Space Time is brought to you by Lawson Media, the makers of the new podcast Moonshot. Moonshot's a podcast exploring the biggest ideas in technology and innovation and the people making them happen. The Moonshot ideas discussed on the show are about to change the world as we know it. Topics already covered include the efforts to go to Mars, the rise of AI or artificial intelligence, humans augmenting their body with technology, Terminator, watch out, the bionic man's on his way, and things that have been especially close to my heart, flying cars and jetpacks. I've been waiting for flying cars and jetpacks since high school, and they're still not here. Well, Moonshot tells you where we're at. There are also great in-depth discussions with entrepreneurs like Brian Johnson, who's invested $100 million of his own money to build chips that can eventually be implanted into your brain to fix problems that may even allow you to learn new skills or abilities in an instant. Moonshot's hosted by journalist Christoph Lawson and Andrew Moon and includes awesome theme music from Breakmaster Cylinder, who did the music for the Reply All podcast. You can subscribe to Moonshot on Apple Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, CastBox FM, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information, visit the website moonshot.audio. That address again, moonshot.audio. And we'd like to thank Lawson Media and Moonshot for supporting Space Time. And now it's back to our show. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for November on Skywatch. November, of course, was heralded by Halloween, or All Hallows' Evening, on the 31st and last day of October. Halloween is based on ancient Celtic pagan festivals, such as Sowin, the Gaelic Festival of the Dead. It's a time when darkness overtakes the light, a reference to the increasing hours of night as the northern hemisphere moves towards winter. It's also meant to signify the end of the harvest. Sowin was eventually Christianized by the early church into All Saints or All Hallows' Eve, Halloween. It's a time when the increased hours of darkness mean the boundary between the world of the living and that of the dead was especially thin, allowing the dead and supernatural to rise in search of the living. And so the living would wear disguises so as not to be recognized by the dead. And of course that's led to today's tradition of the Halloween fancy dress party. In some parts of the world, cross-dressing is also popular on Halloween, a reflection of the secret desires and fantasies of their pagan ancestors. 
to ensure that the crops and livestock survive the cold winter months ahead, offerings of food and drink would be left outside for the spirits and fairies from the other side. And of course that's ultimately led to today's practice of trick or treat. Also, candles would be lit and prayers would be offered to the souls of the dead, as Halloween was a time when the spirits of the dead would return to their former homes. Special bonfires would be lit on Halloween in order to light the darkness, preventing the souls of the dead from returning and keeping the devil away. The flames, smoke and ashes were all deemed to have protective and cleansing powers, and so were used for divination. The practice of apple bobbing originated because the apple was a Celtic symbol of love, and so grabbing the apple with your teeth had certain erotic overtones. Carving pumpkins into jack-o'-lanterns was originally meant to either represent spirits or supernatural beings, or alternatively to ward off evil spirits. In many parts of the world, the Christian religious observance of All Hallows' Eve includes attending church services and lighting candles on the graves of the dead. Historically, Christians abstained from eating meat on All Hallows' Eve, a tradition reflected in the eating of certain vegetarian foods on the day, including apples, potato pancakes and soul cakes. Halloween, of course, is also a time for fortune-telling and divination games, playing pranks to scare people, visiting haunted attractions, telling scary stories, and my favourite, watching horror films. OK, now let's turn to the skies, and high in the northern skies of November, you'll find the constellation Pegasus. Pegasus began as a Mesopotamian and Etruscan mythical winged horse who was born from the blood of Medusa the Gorgon after she was slain by Perseus. The brightest star in Pegasus is the orange supergiant Epsilon Pegasi, located some 690 light years away. It's estimated to have about 12 times the mass of the Sun and is now bloated out to about 185 times the Sun's radius. Epsilon Pegasi, together with the stars Markab, Algenib, Skeet and Alpha Andromedae, form the pattern of stars or astrium known as the Great Square of Pegasus, a bunch of bright naked eye stars shaped like a square. One of the stars in the constellation of Pegasus is 51 Pegasi, which has the distinction of being the first star system beyond the Sun to be discovered to contain a planet. Also visible in Pegasus is the globular cluster M15, or NGC 7078, which is located about 33,600 light years away. Globular clusters are tight balls containing thousands of stars, which were all originally formed in the same molecular gas and dust cloud at the same time. M15 is estimated to be around 12 billion years old. That makes it one of the oldest known globular clusters. It contains an estimated 100,000 stars, making it one of the most densely packed globular clusters in the Milky Way. Its core has undergone a contraction and its core collapse, and it has a central density cusp with an enormous number of stars surrounding what may be a central black hole. M15 also contains at least 112 variable stars, 8 pulsars including one double neutron star system, and the first ever planetary nebula found in a globular cluster. If you're away from city lights, you may notice a fuzzy patch of light right next to Pegasus. This is the giant spiral galaxy M31 Andromeda. Andromeda is the biggest galaxy in the local galactic group. It's located about 2.5 million light years away and contains over a trillion stars, twice that of the Milky Way, and it's about 220,000 light years across. Andromeda and our own galaxy, the Milky Way, are expected to collide in about 3.7 to 4.5 billion years from now eventually merging to form a giant new elliptical galaxy. Observations show Andromeda appears to have far more old red stars than the Milky Way. It also has far less new star production than the Milky Way, and the rate of supernovae in the Milky Way is also about double that of Andromeda. Andromeda is surrounded by a large and massive halo of hot gas, estimated to contain almost half the mass of the stars in the galaxy. This nearly invisible halo stretches about a million light years from its host galaxy, meaning it comes almost halfway towards the Milky Way. If you have access to a backyard telescope or a good pair of binoculars, Andromeda is a spectacular sight to see. You'll be able to pick out dust lanes in Andromeda's spiral arms, and of course its bright central galactic core. Moving to the east and slightly south of Pegasus, we come across the ancient constellation of Cetus, the great whale or sea monster. Beta Ceti, or Deneb Katos, is the brightest star in the constellation. It's an orange giant located about 96 light years away. The name Deneb Katos means the whale's tail. One of the other stars in Cetus is Myra, which is one of the first variable stars ever discovered. Located some 420 light years away, Myra pulses in brightness over a period of 332 days. The change in brightness is caused by its diameter expanding from 400 to around 500 times that of the Sun. 
Alpha Ceti, traditionally called Menkar the Nose, is a red-hued giant star some 220 light years away. It's actually a double star, with the secondary 93 Ceti being a blue-white star some 440 light years away. Gamma Ceti, also known as Kafil Jidma, or the head of the whale, is another double star. Its primary is a yellow star some 82 light years from Earth, while its secondary is a blue star. At 11.9 light years, the yellow dwarf Tau Ceti is the nearest sun like star to the Earth, other than the Sun. South of Cetus is the brilliant star Achamar, which means the river's end, as it marks the end of the river Eridanus. Achenar is a binary system comprising Alpha Aridne, which is the bright star lying just at the southern tip of the constellation Eridanus. The two components of Alpha Aridne are designated Alpha Aridne A and Alpha Aridne B. They're located some 139 light years away. Of the ten apparent brightest stars in the night sky, Alpha Aridne is the hottest and bluest in colour due to Achenar being a spectral type B main sequence star. Interestingly, Achenar has an unusually rapid rotational velocity, causing it to become oblate in shape. The secondary star is a smaller spectral type A white star, which orbits the primary at a distance of about 12 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which equates to about 150 million kilometres, or just over 8 light minutes. If you follow Eridanus towards the east, you'll find Orion the Hunter, a familiar signpost in the southern summer skies. To the west of Orion is the constellation Taurus the Bull. Located in Taurus, you'll find the Crab Nebula, the remnant of a star which Chinese astronomers saw explode as a supernova way back on the 4th of July, 1054. They recorded the sudden appearance of a new star in their sky charts at the exact position of the Crab Nebula. They reported that the supernova appeared brighter than the planet Venus for weeks before finally fading from view after almost two years. The Crab Nebula is located some 7,000 light years away, and it's still expanding at a rate of over 5 million kilometres an hour. At the heart of the nebula is a rapidly spinning neutron star or pulsar, rotating like a lighthouse beacon at some 30 pulses per second. It's emitting radiation at all wavelengths from gamma rays and X-rays through ultraviolet and optical right through to infrared and radio waves. Observations indicate the pulsar is slowing down, and based on its current rate of deceleration, it'll fall to just about half its current rate of rotation within the next thousand years. November is also a good time to check out the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, one of the nearest open star clusters to the Earth. Depending on whose measurements you prefer, they're somewhere between 118 and 137 parsecs away, a parsec being 3.26 light years. Yeah, that's right, Han Solo got it wrong when he spoke about the Millennium Falcon's top speed in parsecs. Also known as M45, the Pleiades are located in the constellation Taurus and are composed mostly of hot blue-white stars. Amazingly, different cultures in vastly different parts of the world all describe the Pleiades as seven sisters or seven women, possibly some ancient throwback to an early common human civilization. Just like October, November sees three meteor showers, the November Orionids, the Taurids and the Leonids. Although peaking late October, the Orionids are continuing to sprinkle down during the start of November and are usually at their best in the small hours before dawn. They're generated by the debris trail left behind by the comet Halley and appear to radiate out from the direction of the constellation Orion the Hunter. The Orionids are swift but don't expect more than three meteors per hour. The Taurid meteor shower is generated by the comet Enki and, as the name suggests, appear to radiate out from the constellation Taurus the Bull. Both Enki and the Taurids may be the remnants of a much larger comet which disintegrated over the past 20,000 to 30,000 years, breaking into several pieces and releasing material through normal comet-like activity and maybe occasionally by close encounters with the gravitational tidal force of the Earth and other planets. In fact, this cometary stream of material is the largest in the inner solar system. Being so spread out, the Earth takes several weeks to pass through it, causing an extended period of meter activity compared to the much smaller periods of activity in other showers. Interactions between these debris trails and Jupiter have caused the Taurids to be segmented into separate northern and southern streams. The southern Taurids usually last from about September the 25th through to November the 25th, while the northern Taurids go from October 12th all the way through to December 2nd. The Taurids are also quite diffuse, usually only producing about 7 meteors per hour. However, they are composed of more massive material, pebbles instead of dust grains. So they tend to produce a high percentage of very bright meteors or fireballs produced by the larger meteoroids as they burn through the atmosphere. 
you can expect the Southern Torrids to put on their best show just after midnight on November 5th. And finally we come to the Leonids meteor shower. It'll peak around November the 18th, producing about 15 meteors an hour. However, it's been known to occasionally produce some really spectacular meteor storms, with showers in 1991, 2001 and 2002, each producing up to 3,000 Leonid meteors an hour. The Leonids usually pick up after midnight, with peaks occurring just before dawn. Produced by debris from the comet Temple Tuttle, the Leonids radiate out from the constellation of Leo the Lion. Larger Leonids can be up to 10 millimetres across, with a mass of up to half a gram, and are known for generating bright meteors. In fact, it's been calculated that the annual Leonids meteor shower usually deposits between 12 and 13 tonnes of particles across the planet. Now also this month, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, look for the comet C-2017-01. It should be a binocular-friendly magnitude 7 or 8 greenish object. Using Polaris, the North Pole Star, as a guide, look in the east to the northeast sky in the late evening. Joining us now is Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, to take us through the rest of our tour for the November night skies on Skywatch. Let's start with what we can see in the mid-evening sky. The Milky Way, which is our galaxy, of course, in which we can, you can see as a sort of a dull, or well, it depends whether you're in the city or the country. In the city, it's a very dull glow, if you can see it at all, uh, like a, just a, like a hazy patch throughout the sky. So the Milky Way is hugging the western horizon at the moment. This is for mid-evening sky in November, right? So the Milky Way is hugging the western horizon with the tail and the stinger of Scorpius sticking up over the horizon. You can't see the body of it, but the tail and stinger are sort of sticking up still. You really can't miss that shape with the stars curling around into a stinger shape like a scorpion. It really does look like a scorpion. Sagittarius is just adjacent to that. Sagittarius is the constellation which, when you start, when you look in that direction, you're looking into the, the centre of our Milky Way galaxy. But that's pretty low in the west at the moment, with sort of disappearing from view over the next few weeks. The planet Saturn is low in the west too, after sunset. It looks like a, a, a moderately bright, slightly yellowish star. So if you see something that looks like that in the western part of the sky after sunset in the first half of November or so, that's probably Saturn you're looking at there. The northern half of the sky at the moment looks pretty bare, filled as it is with a bunch of big constellations, but one that's, that have very few bright stars. Now I'm talking about Pegasus, which is the winged horse, of course. Oh, what was Mr. Red. <laughs> Mr. Red. Oh, well, brr. And you've got Pisces, you've got Cetus, the whale, Aries, the ram, and Eridanus, the river, which is just, a, I don't know how they get some of these shapes. Eridanus the river, right? It's just they did it, did it join the dots uh, of all these different stars, and it goes forever all across the sky. And, I mean, you wouldn't look up in the sky and think, oh, there's a river. I'm still over trying to get over Pegasus the horse, of course. Over in the eastern sky, the constellation Orion is starting to poke its head up above the horizon in the evening during November. Now, this is the sign for us in the south of the planet that summer is approaching. If you're up in the northern half of the planet, I'm afraid it's starting to get colder as winter comes along, but it's the sign that the seasons are changing and for me at least being a southern hemisphere sky watcher i just love coming up to summer because i've got some really great things to see now if you're out there trying to find the southern cross during november and you can't spot it well don't worry you don't need new glasses or anything and during the evening hours at this time of the year the cross is actually upside down and either very low on the horizon the southern horizon that is for some people or it could be hidden below the horizon for other people depending on your latitude because when it has swung around down upside down down the south like that it is actually below the horizon at that point point for you know, the top half of Australia if you like and other people around the southern hemisphere at similar latitudes but on the other hand if you're sky watching in the early hours of the morning you should be able to find the cross lying on its left hand side about a, th a third of the way up from the southern horizon this is because you know the earth has rotated during that time and and we're looking at a slightly different angle so the cross has risen up from below the horizon and there it should be in the sort of very south southeast sky the two pointer stars are nearby they, they call the pointers because they point to towards the Southern Cross. One of them is the famous Alpha Centauri. And why is that famous, Stuart? Because it's the nearest star system. That's not the answer I was expecting. I'll ask it again. Why is it famous, Stuart? Because that's where the Jupiter 2 was headed. Jupiter 2 from Lost in Space. Yes. They were trying to get to Alpha Centauri, the, the, the closest star system to Earth, and they did, couldn't find it. And we know why, don't we? Ah, uh, it's all that Dr. Zachary Smith's fault. <laughs> the pain, yeah, he, 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 he snuck on board and he overbalanced the whole thing and they took off in the wrong direction and, and uh, spent years and years and years trying to, uh, instead of just turning around and coming back. Well, they still managed to find their way to a, a midway fueling point somehow. I remember that in one of the episodes. So if they knew where the mid-flight fueling point was, they couldn't really be lost because they must know where they are then. Well, your, your show would be over, wouldn't it? Well, exactly, yeah. Next, next episode, they're triumphantly landing at Alpha Centauri, and that's the whole uh, show finished. Danger, Will Robinson. Is that your little robot? Yes. I once saw a, um, a Star Trek alarm clock 
it uh, had a switch and it would either give you the it was, it was a speaking alarm clock and either give you a message in English or Klingon and the message was the enterprise is under attack wake up and do something people actually buy those so where, where were we okay yes uh, so um, yes lo- lo- lost in space Jupiter 2 all that sort of thing so about by about 3 a.m. the sky has changed quite a lot as the earth has rotated and it's of course it's brought new constellations into view in the eastern part of the sky so you'll then have Orion really riding high in the northern sky or uh, you know depending on your latitude it might even be you know close to overhead is actually overhead uh, at the equator it sort of straddles the northern and southern halves of the sky Orion does there's also the constellation Canis Major with its bright star Sirius the brightest star in the sky that's high overhead for people in the southern hemisphere it's actually a double latitude. star of course Sirius Sirius is a famous double star of course yeah it's got the tiny companion the other constellations that are appearing in the eastern sky in the early hours you've got Gemini you've got Leo and Cancer they're all visible in the northern half of the sky so give it another couple of months and they'll be up and around the sort of late evening you'll be able to see those in the sky and I've always got a sort of soft spot for those sort of constellations because I was when I was first getting into astronomy these are some of the first ones I, um, I identified and I thought wow I, what I see on my map here I can now equate that into the sky and then oh I know what I'm looking at that's, this that's is what when you were waiting for the dinosaur to go to school Dino <laughs> Yes, Dina. I still Dina. use that description whenever I'm doing a story on seropod dinosaurs. I always say, the ones that look like Dino, everyone well, knows what that means. It's great. Perfect. There you go. Now, if it's planets you're after, as mentioned before, Saturn can be seen in the west just after sunset, or probably for an hour or two after sunset, actually, during November. Um, look a little bit lower down and toward the horizon, though, after sunset, and you might be able to spot Mercury, which just looks like a, a tiny white star. It's going to be in the sort of... A twilight glow, so you've got to look carefully and make sure you don't have any trees and things in the way. If you can see Mercury, try and look just a little bit to its left, and you might see another star, which really is a star this time, and it has a red glow to it, and that's the star Antares. The opposite of Mars. The rival of Mars, yeah. So um, it, the reason being that they both look similar in the, in the sky. They've sort of got this ruddy, reddish sort of colour, and they're fairly bright. And sometimes Mars can find its way along its orbit and, and actually come close to it. Antares, and that looks pretty specky, it's like that. So yeah, Antares is the brightest star in the constellation Scorpius. I said earlier on that if you're out sort of mid-evening, all you can spot is the, the tail of Scorpius sticking up over the horizon. Well, if you're out a bit earlier, around uh, sunset, just after sunset, you can see, if you've got a clear horizon, Antares, but you won't really see much of the rest of the stars of that part of the constellation. Now, by the end of November, Mercury, which we're just talking about, will have risen a little bit higher, actually, and Saturn will have dropped a little bit lower in the sky, and so they should be quite easy to see. And in fact, you'll be able to see them side by side in the evening twilight uh, around the end of November, in the last week of November. So have a look for that. Now, none of the other planets that are bright enough to be seen with the naked eye are visible at, during the evening at the moment. Instead, you'll have to be an early riser. And if you're an early riser, you'll be able to catch Mars in the eastern sky as dawn is beginning. Just talking about Antares, Mars looks like a sort of a, a medium brightness or slightly less than medium brightness star. It's not a star, of course, but that's what it looks like. Reddish, ruddy, sort of orangey colour. So you should be able to spot that out in the eastern sky before dawn. Below it, and really close down to the horizon, actually, though, within the sort of dawn twilight, you should be able to spot Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is much brighter. It's a whitish color, and it's much, much brighter than Mars, but it's going to be down very, very low. And skimming the horizon all month, so low, in fact, you probably won't even spot it, will be Venus, which is really, really bright, but being on the horizon, you probably won't see it because you'll have the glow of the dawn coming up, and this is, I'm talking about like a theoretical, unobstructed horizon with no buildings or trees or hills or anything in the way. But if you can get up high, perhaps on top of a hill you might live on top of a hill or one nearby you can get up if you can get a, a view over the ocean particularly where you've got a nice flat horizon nothing in the way you might just be able to spot Venus coming up over the horizon before the sun does but for otherwise you'll probably have a pretty hard time seeing it with it being so low in the sky and that's Stuart is sky for November it's a good time of the year to be stargazing actually I mean the planets come and go they're visible different times during the year and at different times of the year from year to year so there's no regularity to it in that sense but the constellations they come around the same time every year and the summer constellations that we're getting into now for us here in the southern hemisphere are absolute rippers going to have Orion up high as I said and uh, all the other some of the other constellations of the zodiac the southern cross will start to swing up around again and be higher in the sky during the evening so it's a 
good time of year and of course the weather's good. The only difficulty for astronomers is that the hours of daylight uh, are longer and your hours of night time are shorter. So you've got fewer hours to get out there and do some stargazing, particularly if it's getting dark later at night. You've got to wait up later at night to get your stargazing in. A lot of people have got to get to bed and go to work, that kind of thing. So swings and roundabouts, good weather, good stuff to see, but shorter night, you've got to sort of play them off against each other. Now we've been getting a lot of chatter about blue aurora being seen in the northern hemisphere. So I did a bit of digging about this because aurora normally aren't blue, they're pink or greenish sort of colour. Guess what it turned out to be? Mm -hmm. Bunch of Russian rocket tests. The Russians were carrying out military exercises and as part of that they were firing a lot of rockets and those rockets give off a blue exhaust. That's what people were seeing. Isn't that interesting? I know that the Russians launched a bunch of ICBMs as a show of force, those intercontinental ballistic missiles. So that can, um, yeah. In fact, you know, there have been um, scientific tests where they've sent what they call sounding rockets up. Sounding rockets are ones that don't go into orbit. They go basically just straight up. They're small rockets. These like the black branch and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and even smaller ones. And and they go up and they can release clouds of chemicals and things and try and induce artificial auroras. And the benefit there is that because you know what you're putting into the atmosphere, fingers crossed you get it right then uh, and you do get the result you want, you know what's caused the result that you get. So that happens from time to time. A couple of other strange things you might see in the sky. There was one of, oh, some years back now, I'm trying to think maybe 10 years ago, who knows, some people in uh, sort of northern Europe and around Scandinavia spotted this incredible corkscrew looking cloud moving in the sky and they thought wow UFO and everything but no it was a rocket launch that had gone wrong and the rocket was spinning and tumbling out of control but it was causing this beautiful corkscrew effect in the night sky really would have been quite eerie if you didn't know what it was and something else you can sometimes see I haven't seen these reported for a very very long time but um, some amateur astronomers used to spot these uh, because they were looking for these sorts of things and that is when they send a a satellite up into orbit very often the first orbit the satellite like it's put into is a, is a sort of a transition orbit. It might have a very low, low point and a very high, high point. And then what they do is they fire a motor called the apogee kick motor at the right time. And that then will circularize the orbit at the altitude they want, which is probably that high point. And what happens when you get this uh, apogee kick motor going off is all these hot gases uh, come out of the exhaust of the rocket and spread out into space. And a rocket nozzle, of course, is like a cone. So the exhaust tends to spread out in a triangular sort of fashion if you look at it from the side. And you, if you know that that's going to happen if you you know follow your rocket launches and things and you know that there's going to be this satellite in a certain orbit and it's going to fire its apogee kick motor at a certain time and it's within your view so not on the other side of the earth where you can't see it but if it's in your night sky then you can go out and you should be able to see this little triangular cloud spreading out in space it doesn't last very long because it dissipates very quickly but that's something that gets reported to as ufos and things but that's just the rocket motor going off of a satellite way way up hundreds or thousands of kilometres above the Earth to get it into its correct orbit and this little triangular cloud that sort of goes out for a while and then just slowly dissipates. So all sorts of interesting things you can see in the night sky. You know, I've been looking at the night sky for, I don't know, 40 years or something and I'm by no means, uh, you know... Um, by no means the most skilled uh, night sky observer or star watcher or anything. But I have to say that in all my years of looking at the sky, I have never seen anything that's unexplained or unexplainable. Uh, None of this UFO nonsense, um, everything I've seen and everything I've heard reported from everyone else, perfectly explicable. And yet there are still people who uh, tell you that the Earth is flat. I saw another one of these flat Earth stickers the other day. Well, what you need to do then is, you know, um, send them a round-the-world ticket and see what they have to say about that. Well, look, I've got a bridge they should be buying. Uh, the bridge, yeah, yeah. I tell you what, uh, should be making a rather spectacular splash, so to speak, sometime over the next few months, and, and that'll be the Chinese Tanangong-1 space station, which is now out of control and will soon be re-entering Earth's atmosphere in any time now, in fact, between now and April. Any time now and any place, too, because they don't really know what's going to come down, do they? No, it just purely depends on what the atmosphere is doing at the time, how expanded the atmosphere is. This is the problem, of course, with a uh, spacecraft that goes out of control. If it's a low-Earth orbit spacecraft, that uh, if you lose control of it, like they did with Skylab all those years ago, then you don't really have any way of controlling where it comes down. When you do have a way of controlling where it comes down, which is most of the cases, of course, they drop it into the, the far southeastern Pacific Ocean, and there's a graveyard of satellites there. I, do you remember me? I do indeed. Uh, we, we covered that live on ABC News Radio. I remember getting up early one morning and going to South Head in Sydney, Australia. So this is the, this is the south head of the, the harbour. Good spot to look out over the ocean. And I was there with a film crew from one of the TV stations because I think we were going to see, I think it was the second last orbit 
mm. of mere second or third last orbit. Very low down the horizon. It was been there was, was cloud everywhere, but we just managed to see it. This sort of dull red sort of glow as this uh, uh, looked like a little satellite on the horizon, just for about five minutes or so, going from north to south. And that was mere. I think it was its second or third last orbit. Shortly after that, it burned up in the atmosphere, or most of it would have at least, and any bits that left over dropped into the ocean. Yeah, 130 tons worth, and uh, they were able to bring it down exactly as they wanted to. Something which, for some reason, the Chinese don't appear to be able to do, which is sort of sad. Sort of don't want chicken little to be right. Well, I'm surprised, actually. I'm, I'm quite surprised that um, uh, this has happened um, because the, the Chinese get these things pretty right most of the time. They've, they've had good success with their, their spacecraft up there, but... You know, it can happen to the best of you. Um, something breaks down unexpectedly and you lose control. Well, that's nothing you can do, really, unless you have some astronauts up there who can fix it. But, of course, not the case in this instance. Something has has gone wrong and uh, they've lost control of it. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have now risen to 403.3 parts per million, its highest level in over 800,000 years as a result of man-made greenhouse gas emissions. The new 2016 record published by the World Meteorological Organization is also significantly higher than the disastrous 2015 level of 400 parts per million. The increase in concentrations of atmospheric greenhouse gases began in 1750 with the start of the Industrial Age. CO2 levels and global temperatures have been steadily rising ever since. To work out what carbon dioxide levels would have been like 800,000 years ago, scientists used Antarctic ice core measurements dating back to that time. Scientists say the latest figures have been made even worse by a stronger-than-usual El Nino event. The increase of 3.3 parts per million is significantly higher than the 2.3 parts per million rise of the previous 12 months, and also higher than the average annual increase over the past decade of 2.08 parts per million. The study found atmospheric carbon dioxide is now increasing 100 times faster than it did at the end of the last ice age. In fact, the last time Earth experienced a similar CO2 concentration was some 3 to 5 million years ago, when sea levels were some 20 metres higher than what they are now. A new study warns that people who regularly use acid reflux drugs known as proton pump inhibitors after being treated for cancer-causing gut bacteria, were more than twice as likely to develop stomach cancer. The bacterium Helicobacter pylori is a known risk factor for stomach cancer. So researchers looked at some 63,397 people who had been treated for Helicobacter pylori, finding that 153 people still went on to develop stomach cancer even after the bacteria was eradicated. The findings reported in the journal Gut concluded that cases of cancer were more common among people who regularly took proton pump inhibitors, especially for daily users. A new study concludes that migration rather than murder was the most likely cause for the ultimate disappearance of the Neanderthals. The findings reported in the journal Nature Communications run contrary to previous hypotheses that competition from Homo sapiens or environmental change was what ultimately led to the extinction of Neanderthal. Instead, the new research suggests modern human migration from Africa into the Eurasian continent could explain the disappearance of Neanderthals. The research is based on new modelling of species drift, which shows that the Neanderthals were certain to end up being replaced. The authors say the shift into Eurasia was gradual, and the Neanderthals were replaced by small groups of modern humans until completely eliminated. A new study of dingo DNA has revealed that dingoes most likely migrated into Australia in two separate waves by way of a former land bridge with Papua New Guinea. The findings reported in the Journal of Ecology and Evolution has significant implications for conservation. Researchers now recommend that the two genetically distinct populations of dingoes, one in the southeast and the other in the northwest of the country, be treated as separate groups for management and conservation purposes. Particle physicists and ancient Egyptians may seem like strange bedfellows, but a hidden void in the Great Pyramid of Giza has been discovered by archaeologists using cosmic ray-based imaging. A report in the journal Nature claims the team were trying to learn more about the internal structure of the pyramid, built around 2500 BCE by the pharaoh Khufu. To do so, they used non-invasive muon imaging technology. Muons are heavier versions of electrons. 
They're also byproducts from cosmic rays and can penetrate stone and distinguish cavities from solid formations. During the scans, the authors detected a large void around 30 metres long above the Grand Gallery, which was confirmed by three different muon scanning techniques. While the researchers don't know what the chamber was used for, they say it shows how modern particle physics can shed new light on some of the world's most ancient structures. And finally for now, a new study has found that 7 out of 10 mammoth fossils are males. The findings reported in the journal Current Biology indicate that the likely reason for the gender imbalance is that the boys were inexperienced and tended to travel alone. Paleontologists think this may have led to lone mammoths getting in trouble, not dissimilar to human males. The authors were surprised by the imbalance of genders from the fossils, which led them to do some extra digging. They say the woolly mammoths probably lived similar lifestyles to modern elephants, where the males tend to live alone or in bachelor groups and tend to engage in more risky behaviour, again, just like their adolescent human counterparts. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. This episode of Space Time was brought to you by Moonshot, the podcast that explores the biggest ideas in technology and innovations and the people making them happen. You can subscribe to Moonshot wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and Pocket Casts. Moonshot. Check it out today.